Welcome to Star Wars Comics and Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 74. Hello then guys, this week I am tackling the final volume of probably my favourite comic in existence at the time of recording this, which is the 2017 Darth Vader run by Charles Soule. Now apologies if I sound a little bit off uh, because I'm just getting over COVID and for clarity I've had both vaccinations and I was somewhat careful but then we went to a gig um, of like 16,000 people and then I think that Megan got it and then I got it. Uh, So if I sound a little bit weird it's because I can't really breathe through my nose at the moment Um, but don't worry I've been self-isolating and all that other sort of stuff and I'm doing well and I'm on the up and up so I thought I've got enough energy to be able to record a podcast so here I am. Anyway enough of my private life because you guys probably don't want to hear about that until right at the end when I ramble. Uh, So let's get on to the ins and outs of this comic and I want to clarify for any new listeners I go through each comic I go through general bullet points of the plot and then the main thing is talking about the many connections to other Star Wars content including characters species and that sort of thing and uh this one is a doozy. Uh, there's a very fun part right at the very end in uh, issue 7 where there's about 10 or 12 Jedi there and I can name all of them, which, you know, life goals, I suppose. Um, but I'll get onto that way down the line towards the end of this podcast. But um, before we get into all that, let's get into the information to do with this comic itself. So I'm going to be tackling seven issues this week, issues 19 to 25 of the 2017 run of Darth Vader comics, which is the second run in the new canon. It is volume four, which is the collection called Fortress Vader. Issue 19 was released in August 2018. Issue 25 was released December 2018. The trade paperback collection was August 2020. And the Omnibus, which is all 25 of this run of Darth Vader comics, as well as the annual that I tackled in the last episode about Vader, which I think was episode 70. All of that is included in the Omnibus, and that's going to be released November 2021. In previous episodes, I said October 2020. 21, but it seems to have been pushed back. The writer for this whole series is Charles Saul. The penciler is Giuseppe Cayman Coley. The inker is Danielle Orlandini. And then there are several colour artists. So you've got David Curiel, who did the colour work for all of these issues apart from issue number 20. You've then got Dono Sanchez Almara, who did the colouring for issues 20, 23, 24 and 25. And then you've got Eric Arsinega, who did the colouring for issues 20 and 25. So it's three colour artists on issue 25, and issue 25 is probably my favourite comic of all time, so uh, I'm very excited to get onto that one, but as I say with all these guys, you know, make sure you try and pick up these comics, or read them on Marvel Unlimited, or Hoopla, or whatever, because these comics are visually stunning, but the final issue especially, and I'll repeat these words when we get to it, really, really helps from you being able to read it and see it, because the artwork is just incredible, and obviously I'll do my best at explaining what's going on generally, but if you don't read any Star Wars comics this year, apart from one, read issue 25 of this Darth Vader run. It's incredible, and you will not regret it. So with that all in mind, guys, let's get on to the crawl. The Republic is overthrown. Emperor Palpatine rules the galaxy with an iron fist. Second only to the Emperor is Palpatine's apprentice, the fearsome Darth Vader. Vader's fall to the dark side of the Force and the defeat at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi leaves him confined in a suit of cybernetic armour to preserve his life. Now, he lives only to serve his master's empire. To ensure the survival of this new order, Vader leads a squad of dark side adepts, the Inquisitorius, in rooting out and destroying the greatest threat to Palpatine's rule, the remaining Jedi Knights. And I want to clarify here that this takes place approximately 14 years before the Battle of Yavin. Uh, So that is about five years after Revenge of the Sith, there thereabouts. And so it's 
Around the time of Jedi Fallen Order, the game, I think these comics take place like slightly before then. And then that's also a year or so before the events of Solo, you know, right at the start of Solo. And then it's about four years before the events of Solo after the little flash and jump forward part after he's in the army and all that sort of thing. So that's generally how you can see it. And it's around 10 years before the events of Star Wars Rebels, which obviously you see the Inquisitors in Star Wars Rebels as well. So that's a good idea of where this is in the timeline. And obviously this is the final volume of the Vader comics of this run. And the next run that I'm going to be tackling, which I'll detail at the end, will be the 2020 run, uh, which takes place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And for clarity, the first run, the 2015 run, with Dr. Aphra's first appearance and etc. Those took place between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. So uh, with that all in mind, clarifying that this is about five years after Avenger the Sith and near enough 14 years before the events of the other Vader comics, let's get into the details of issue number 19, which is the first of seven. So the issue starts with a Zabrak woman having a baby, and then Vader enters. Now, Zabraks, for clarity, they're humanoid beings. They're basically humans that have got facial markings and horns coming out the top of their heads. Um, Darth Maul, he was a Zabrak. He was from Dathomir, so it's like a slight alteration because they specifically had a lot of tattoos and those sort of things. And the Dathomirian Zabraks are actually Knight Brothers more so, but they're still Zabraks in themselves. There are plenty of other Jedi that are Zabraks. And the Jedi that is in this specific scene is Eeth Koth, who you actually can see in The Phantom Menace. I believe you can see him in Attack of the Clones as well. And you can also see him in The Clone Wars. But for clarity, he is not the person who goes against Palpatine with Mace Windu and Kit Fisto. That is someone else, but I'll get into that in one moment. So Eeth Koth, as I said, he was a Jedi Council member, and then he got replaced in the Council by a guy called Agent Kolar, who is the person who fought Palpatine. Eeth Koth left the Order during the Clone Wars. It was off screen, it seems. You don't ever really get an explanation. He's just in the Clone Wars for a while, and then he's just not. It's not like a gaping hole of him not being there. He just kind of stops being in it. And then you don't see him again until this comic. A little behind the scenes thing, this happens, you notice a lot in the prequels. It happened with Eeth Koth, who became Agent Kolar, and it also happened with the Thalothian, which I mentioned in the previous episode, number 73. I think it's Adi Gallia and Stas Ali, which is basically just there was a character, they went in for makeup or prosthetics or whatever to be in one of the films, and then in the following film, they either put the prosthetics on and it didn't look the same, or they had to use a different actor, and then that made them look quite a bit different. And because of that, they initially were like, oh, it'll be fine. And then when they check the footage, they're like, okay, these two people, even though they're the same species, look completely different. And that's what happened with Eeth Koth. So that is one of the reasons why just seemingly in the prequels, Eeth Koth just changes. So as I said, Eeth Koth... He's the one that you'll see in The Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones and in The Clone Wars and stuff, whereas the person who fought Palpatine was Agent Kolar. They're both Zabraks, they both look quite similar, but as I said, they are different people. And also a little bit of fun, the other people who fought against Palpatine along with Mace Windu was Kit Fisto, who is Megan's favourite Jedi, and the other character was Sacy Teen. So back to the story. Eeth Koth is now a priest. He obviously was hiding from being a Jedi, and this is, you know, five odd years since Order 66. He tries to say to Vader, look, I'm not a Jedi anymore. I left the Order before even the end of the Clone Wars. Please just kind of let me live with my family. I'm just a priest now. You know, I just do weddings and funerals and those sort of things. And then Vader stares at him and says, funerals. And Eeth Koth knows exactly what's about to happen. So he yells to his wife, Mira, run. She grabs the baby and then Eeth Koth blows a hole in the side of the wall. She runs out through there and then Eeth Koth also uses the force and pulls his lightsaber out from this like wall crevice thing. So you've then got quite a few panels of Eeth fighting with Vader. There are a lot of cool panels and things, you know, as I said, in this whole volume of comics, there are so many great things that I really encourage you guys to see. And if anyone's going to purchase any Star Wars comics under the sun, this whole Darth Vader run is exactly what I'd say. From the start all the way up to issue 25, they're just... For me, there isn't a weak issue. I think it's excellent. There's loads of connections to other content. Visually, it's stunning. You get a lot of information about how Anakin slash Vader was struggling with things. But obviously, you guys probably know all these things because you've been good little listeners and checked out the other three episodes I've done on this whole Vader run. But just in case you haven't, check out episodes 62, 66, and 70 so that you're fully up to date with this whole story. 
So anyway, yeah, Ethan and Vader are fighting. Vader tells the Inquisitors to pursue the woman and get the baby. And the Inquisitors basically find her because she's just walking through the streets. And this Inquisitor, who is a red-skinned female Inquisitor, that's all the information we get, we don't even know her species, she lets this woman and her baby board a ship, which then takes off and starts to fly away. The fifth brother then sees this happening, who is a character who does show up in Star Wars Rebels. And then the red-skinned Inquisitor woman then uses the Force and actually pulls the baby from the mother's grasp out of the window of the starship into their hands. The mother is like screaming and things, but the person on board the ship with the mother says, look, we can't go back. If we do, we'll just get killed. Let's just hope the baby survives. That's all we can really do. So while this is happening, Vader and Eth are both fighting each other, and then the Inquisitor gets to Vader and Eth Goth with the baby. Eth Goth is distracted by the baby, and then Vader stabs a saber through his chest, and Eth Goth is now dead. So with that sorted, Vader then goes to Coruscant with the Inquisitors and the baby. Vader passes the baby to a couple of people who come up to the ship, and then speaks to the Grand Inquisitor. And it's confirmed that bar like a few that seem to be in hiding, there don't actually seem to be many Jedi left because of the last five years of Vader and the Inquisitors hunting them, basically any that aren't hiding really, really well have been killed. Now you may remember in the second volume of the Vader comics I tackled a while ago that there were some names on a hologram projection in Arabesh with names like Yoda and Obi-Wan and a few other people on there. Well, there's another panel where there's some different names in Arabesh. So you've still got Obi-Wan on there as well as Yoda. You've then got two names that are just variations of Charles Saul and Giuseppe Kamen Coley who don't show up ever again. uh, So we don't need to worry about those names. And then there's two other names that show up, which is Coleman Kaj and Oppo Rancisis. Now they're both obviously prequel era Jedi. Coleman Kaj is an Ongri and is in the Clone Wars a little bit and you can see them in Revenge of the Sith. Ongri is the species. And then the other character is Oppo Rancisis, which is a character once again in the Clone Wars and you see them in the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. And they also lived throughout the High Republic as well. Now Oppo Rancisis is a Thispiesian and They're basically like these snake people, but they're very hairy. It's kind of hard to explain, but it's just like from the sort of torso upwards, they're very hairy and somewhat reptilian. And when you see Operanzis, it just looks like a hairy person. But from the torso downward, it's like this snake tail, but they are quite good at making themselves look more humanoid. But yeah, that's Operanzis, quite a strange looking individual in the background, but as I said, does appear on the High Republic and those sorts of other things too. Now, the conversation that the Grand Inquisitor and Vader are talking about is something called Project Harvester, which continues, but now they must wait before any more Jedi pop up. Now, Project Harvester is basically just killing all the Jedi and stealing Force-sensitive children for Imperial service. It's been mentioned in bits and pieces in the canon, not explicitly by the name Project Harvester. There is bits and pieces where it does. I think the first time it's kind of referenced is in the Clone Wars. There's, I think the episode is called Children of the Force or something similar to that, and it's basically got Palpatine trying to steal for sensitive children you've got Cad Bane I think the plot of the Clone Wars movie might be to do with this from what I can vaguely remember but I also remember the Holocron heist which I think is the finale of series one of the Clone Wars or it's the premiere episode of series two of the Clone Wars they kind of continue on from each other the bounty hunter Cad Bane basically breaks into the Jedi Temple and steals a data crystal which has got the names of all the four sensitive children on it and also in the game jedi fallen order which is excellent i highly recommend that to people in that there's also sidious and the inquisitors or more so vader and the inquisitors are trying to steal a copy of that data crystal because seemingly more than one copy got made and so they're just trying to find you know jedi had this big list of four sensitive children and then when they got to the age of well, a certain age is kind of vague when it is. It seems to be like two or three sometimes, sometimes earlier. When that happens in the Jedi, go and visit the planet, talk to the parents and say, look, do you want us to take your kid away and train them up as a monk, basically? And obviously Sidious heard about that and then wanted that list because then he could just grab it to people and use them for his inquisitors. So that's in short Project Harvester. It's a bit more details to that, but that's what I'm going to go into here. And so because the Grand Inquisitor says you've done such a good job, basically now we just wait. It then has a montage of Vader doing some training. He does some meditation. He tweaks his armor and whatnot. But he seemingly is just kind of running out of things to do. And it shows that there's the Inquisitors are happily drinking after getting rid of yet another Jedi. They've got this like tradition where they drink on a planet where they capture or kill a Jedi. And they're drinking this stuff called dust juice. The red-skinned Inquisitor that I mentioned before. And this other Inquisitor who is a black-skinned Twi'lek. As in... 
I've not seen a Twi'lek who actually looks like this. Like their skin is genuinely like jet black. Uh, normally Twi'lek seem to have slightly lighter complexioned, although they do have a variety of different color skins. This Twi'lek and this red skinned individual are sat talking, um, having this drink, and they question what Vader would actually do without any more Jedi to hunt. And as they're discussing this, Vader then appears. He ignites his lightsaber, and that is where issue number 19 ends. So on to issue number 20. Vader brings his saber down onto that female Inquisitor, and the male Twi'lek blocks Vader's lightsaber with his own. The Grand Inquisitor then asks Vader if he's doing a bit more training. Vader calmly says no, and he says that he senses there is some attachment between the two Inquisitors. And he confirms that the Twi'lek's actions confirms that they're now both guilty. The Grand Inquisitor says, do you want me to help you at all? Do you want the Inquisitors to help? And Vader once again declines, and pursues the Inquisitors who run off into Coruscant. Vader pursues the two Inquisitors on this clone piloted speeder, and then the engine of the ship blows. Vader jumps onto another speeder that's flying through Coruscant, and then a couple of lightsabers get thrown, slice the speeder, and then Vader has to dive off yet again. The wreckage of that second speeder then falls onto this couple that are drinking on a rooftop, and crushes them both. Meanwhile, with Vader is still pursuing these Inquisitors, and they are now throwing speeders at each other, which is quite interesting to watch. While Vader is evading these speeders or throwing them back, the Inquisitors then slam this statue down, which collides with Vader, and then he falls onto a rooftop and kind of tumbles. The two Inquisitors then pursue, they land on the rooftop that Vader is on, he's on the floor, and the Inquisitors raise their lightsaber to then slam down on Vader. Vader uses the Force to freeze them both into place, they then speak to each other and say, yeah, we didn't think this was going to go any further, we didn't think we'd die in our sleep or anything nice like that, and then Vader uses the Force to make them both stab each other, and they both collapse to the floor. It's confirmed that basically it's kind of reading between the lines and there's a bit of dialogue. In essence, they fancied each other. They were in love, if you want to put it that way, but these two Inquisitors were developing feelings for each other and that's why the Twi'lek then saved the red-skinned Inquisitor. So Vader is then speaking with Palpatine and he explains the reason he killed that Inquisitor was because the Inquisitor would have let Ian Koth's child go had the other Inquisitor not seen them. Palpatine says that he's not happy with the trail of destruction that Vader left behind him. You know, this is the city that Palpatine is meant to be running the galaxy from, and if he can't keep that in check, it makes it look like he can't control the rest of the galaxy. And with Vader going across destroying basically loads of speeders and buildings that were on fire and people that have been killed, including there was actually a senator that was having a nice drink with a lover of theirs on a rooftop, and because of Vader's fight, the speeder slammed onto them and killed them, which obviously is the couple I mentioned slightly earlier. And Palpatine says that that has put a thorn in his plans, and so he needs to move the Inquisitor's base because he just can't have all this destruction happening in Coruscant. Palpatine gives Vader Padme's old ship. Palpatine then says that he's got another job for Vader. Vader says no. Palpatine seems a little bit shocked by that. And Vader says that he wants a world. Palpatine says he could have Naboo. He could even have Tatooine if he wanted. And Vader says no. He wants Mustafar. And that is where comic number 20 ends. Now a bit of information here. What's fun to think about is if Vader had said yes to having Tatooine, he probably would have found Luke and then the entire downfall of the Empire probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, But that's a whole other thing. Um, With Padme's ship. So this is the ship that you see in The Phantom Menace. It's the one that lands on Tatooine. It's very, very shiny. It's basically like a giant shaped mirror almost. But the specific ship is a Naboo Royal Starship. It is a modified J-Type 327 Nubian Starship. And as well as seeing it in The Phantom Menace, it's also mentioned in the Queen's books by E.K. Johnston. Uh, E.K. Johnston, she wrote the Ahsoka novel, which is fairly good. It's worth a read, I suppose. Uh, If you want a little bit of bridging the gap of what happened to Ahsoka after the events of Season 7 of The Clone Wars and before her appearance in Rebels, and you also get to find out how she kind of got her white lightsabers and stuff, it's a pretty cool book. It's not like essential, essential for reading, but this was made before the confirmation that Series 7 of The Clone Wars was going to happen. So before there was a Season 7 of the Clone Wars, it was amazing because it gave a little bit of information about the Siege of Mandalore and that sort of thing. But because Season 7's come out, there are certain elements of it that are not quite redundant, but one would already know them. But anyway, I would recommend reading the book if you're a big Ahsoka fan. It's not that long and it's it's worth a read if you want it. Um, but E.K. Johnson also wrote, as I said, the Queen's books. There's the Queen's Shadow, the Queen's Peril, and I believe there's another book coming out soon called The Queen's Something Else. It's basically about Padme as well as Padme's handmaidens who do actually appear in the 2020 run of Darth Vader comics which is what I'll be tackling in about four or five weeks time when I do the next batch of Vader comics running up to War of the Bounty Hunter 
characters. And just some clarity on the handmaidens. So the two you probably know the names of most will be Sabe, who is played by Kira Knightley in The Phantom Menace. She plays Padme's decoy in the film. And then in Attack of the Clones, Rose Byrne's character, which is Dorme, is another handmaiden of Padme's. So they're the two main ones that show up on screen. There are multiple other ones. I think one or two pop up in the Clone Wars as well. There's a few handmaidens of Padme's who basically are like trained in a very specific way and they're kind of outside of standard Naboo security and things like that. There's a lot of nuances and information about them, so I can't do it justice here. But if you want to know more information on Padme and her handmaidens, then check out the three E.K. Johnston books, Queen's Peril, Queen's Shadow, and Queen's Hope. And if you want to see more appearances of this uh, Nubian starfighter, obviously they'll be in there as well. Obviously they're books, so you won't get to see them. You just have to use your imagination. Moving on to the next issue, which is number 21, you've got Vader on that ship I mentioned with two Imperial officers. One of them is a female called Alva, and the other one's name is not relevant. Alva asks why they're going to Mustafar, and then it shows a flashback of Vader walking with Palpatine. Palpatine confirms that Alva helped him alter the Jedi Temple for him, and says that he's appointed Alva to help Vader with his base and whatever he wants to do. Palpatine then asks Vader why he chose Mustafar, and then it flashes back to now. Vader obviously doesn't answer Alva, because he doesn't answer anyone he doesn't have to, and then the ship exits hyperspace by Mustafar. Alva and this other Imperial discuss Vader and how he's quite intimidating and those sort of things. And then there's an emergency alert on the ship. They're entering the atmosphere, but there's no shields on the ship. So Alva runs to the cockpit and speaks to Vader, and it's confirmed that he has actually turned the shields off. She questions why and reaches for her blaster. He immediately pulls the blaster off of her and says that Palpatine told you to serve, so sit down and say nothing. So the ship is now entering Mustafar, and to remind you guys, Mustafar is a lava planet. Obviously, you see it in Revenge of the Sith. And as the ship is entering Mustafar, it is burning heavily. The ship is basically all completely on fire. The inside of the cockpit is going a bit mental. The Imperials are freaking out. They're worried they may die. And as the ship is kind of flying down to land, it looks like a meteor is falling down. And you see some local Mustafarians kind of see the ship coming down. And one of the elders mentions it may be a bad omen. The ship then lands on a rock and it's shown that its entire exterior has been melted and burned. And Alva makes a comment saying, ah, I can see this is Vader's aesthetic. Without many words, Vader then heads into a cave nearby where he landed the ship, and it turns out it's the place that he bled the lightsaber crystal over back in the first volume of these comics. It then shows the flashback to Palpatine, where Palpatine repeats himself and says, you know, although I appreciate you being quiet a lot of the time, Vader, when I ask you a question, I expect an answer, so why are you choosing Mustafar? And Vader confirms that he saw deeper into the Force than he ever has seen when he bled his lightsaber crystal. And the place he bled his lightsaber crystal was a dark side locus. Now, a locus in the Force is basically just like a concentrated place. I couldn't find like an explicit definition for it online, but it's basically a convergence of the Force. It's a place there's a lot of Force energy. One place I think is kind of a locus of the Force is the dark side cave on Dagobah that Yoda makes Luke go into. So it's basically just a place where there's a lot of Force energy. So it shows that now Vader is telling the Imperials that he came to study. So Alva says that she'll start designing on the building or structure that he wants. After a little bit, Alva then takes the design to Vader. He immediately rejects it without any footnotes or any suggestions, so she goes back to the ship. She then lets out a massive scream. Vader then goes to the ship and checks, and it shows she is dead on the ship with a hole where her heart was, seemingly shot by a blaster. Vader then goes in, sees the remaining Imperial who is there, wearing the mask of Momin. He slashes the person wearing this mask, and then sees a design for his castle. And that is where the comic ends. So a bit of information here, it does do a little flashback where Palpatine talks about Momin, but in essence, the mask of Lord Momin, he is a ancient Sith Lord. You do get some backstory for Momin in the next issue that I'm going to tackle, so I'll give you a bit more information. But the mask of Momin actually appears in the Lando miniseries, also written by Charles Saul. I tackle that in episode 18 of Styles Comics and Canon, so I do give some more backstory in that. And it also does appear in a flashback of the audio drama Dooku Jedi Lost. It was in the Bogan collection, which is a place that the Jedi used to keep loads of old artifacts, both Sith and otherwise. But in essence, Momin is a Sith architect. He prefers to create, and he uses the Force in unique ways. He was deemed a heretic by both the Jedi and the Sith, and Palpatine knows all this information because the Mask spoke to Palpatine and told him. And Palpatine appreciates Momin because he wants to create rather than solely to destroy like many of the Sith before him. And the Mask itself is its not quite haunted, it's kind of somewhat possessed by Momin, but I'll get into that into the next issue, which is number 22. So issue 22 starts with Vader taking the Momin mask to the dark side locus. 
and then you get a full backstory on Momen. Uh, in essence, he creates to cause an emotion, usually pain and fear and things. When he was young, he was arrested for creating this monstrosity that you don't actually get to see, but you get to see a little bits and snippets of it, and it, it looks pretty scary. It looks like some sort of amalgamation of flesh and Lord knows what else. So anyway, he's arrested when he's young for being unsettled or whatever, and then he gets saved by a Sith Lord named Lady Shah. So Shah taught Momin for a while, trained him in the arts, and explained to him about the Sith ways and etc. And then he killed her. But unlike a lot of other Sith, he never took on an apprentice because he killed her. He didn't like having to refer to someone as master. He just wanted to learn and he didn't want to take an apprentice because that means he'd have to then teach someone and he doesn't want to teach anyone. He just wants to learn and do his own thing. So after a few panels and things, it shows that he created this weapon to basically destroy a civilization, but moments before it gets destroyed, he would input himself and use the force to stop the flow of time so that all of the inhabitants of said civilization would all look up in fear and doom and gloom and have that look that they're going to die, and then in theory time would stop and they'd be frozen in place, and for him that would be some kind of sadistic art project, basically, that he would want to to happen. So that was his goal, to basically make a civilization moments before they're about to be destroyed and freeze them in time so he can witness their terror. So he goes to do this in this big ship thing, and some Jedi found Momin. Now he does have some acolytes with him, and they try to hold off the Jedi but fail. Now acolytes are just followers of the Sith who aren't necessarily force sensitive, I think a lot of the time they're basically not. Acolytes of the Sith, they get mentioned in the Aftermath novels by Chuck Wendig. Um, there's a few of them that I think get aligned with Acolytes, which are actually seen, I think, incredibly briefly in the original trilogy. And one of them, I believe, you get to see in Rogue One when you go to Vader's castle and you've got that old dude who lets in Orson Krennic and then goes and talks to Vader when he's in the back to tube. It's basically just seemingly loads of old dudes who worship the dark side but aren't force sensitive. So they try and bring about the new age of the Sith and things. There's a lot of hints in canon that hasn't been explicitly confirmed, but there's a lot of hints that show that the Acolytes of the Beyond are in part responsible for either Snoke or, you know, the rise of the First Order and things. Obviously, Palpatine is the reason for that happening as it gets explained in The Rise of Skywalker, but the Acolytes are individuals who helped him quite a lot. You know, his place in Exegol where he's been cloned and all this sort of other stuff, that couldn't have happened without some sort of followers to him. So they are mentioned in the Aftermath books a fair amount, and as I said, they are kind of dotted around the canon a bit, but that's generally what an acolyte is, Sith followers basically. So anyway, these acolytes of Momin failed to hold back the Jedi, and so the Jedi are then on this ship where Momin's trying to destroy civilization. Momin lost control while he's trying to, you know, seep his force energy into it and stop the flow of time and all this other stuff, and because of that, the dark side takes more than death in tribute. So obviously he was trying to do lots of dark side stuff. And before the Jedi get to where Momin was holding this strange panel thing, all that was left was his mask and smoldering ashes. So obviously the dark side always requires a tribute. That's as I just said, it is one of those things where like a contributing rumor or theory as to why Palpatine looks the way he does in Revenge of the Sith isn't actually because he used force lightning, Mace Windu reflects it back on himself and it melted him enough to make him deformed. But it was actually that he already looked like that deformed, but he was using the force to kind of hide how he was actually looking. And then all of that sort of dark side energy going into him kind of made him look how he should truly look. And I know in Legends, there's a lot of stuff where it's like there's been Sith that have almost died and then come back and their skins all like rotting and all kinds of other horrible stuff. And Darth Vader has that to a degree. Obviously, he's kept alive with cybernetics and things, but there's a lot of stuff around that says, you know, he's only alive because of the dark side of the force. And so he's in this constant pain all the the time and that's kind of the deal is that he survived the battle on Mustafar but he has to be in pain basically forever so there's lots of little bits and pieces that kind of connect together one of the many reasons I love Charles Saul's writing and things because there's as I said almost any page relatively maybe any few pages in this entire comic run you could almost take out and have a whole podcast talking about them uh, and at the end I'm going to talk about a podcast which I was involved with which actually I did have a conversation about issue 25 of this and issue number one but I'm getting ahead of myself so the story itself, you know, goes back and it's got Momin, he lost control, etc. He was then just this smouldering thing and all that was left was the mask. And then the last panel of that flashback, you get to see a Jedi pick up the mask of Momin and then it goes back to where Vader is. So it shows that Vader is now actually wearing the mask for a moment, and I think as he kind of comes to after seeing all this flashback vision stuff, he throws the mask off and then puts his own normal Vader mask on. He then goes outside and there's a few Mustafarians who are trying to 
take the fortress and he brings the Momen mask with him, slices down a few Mustafarians and then puts the Momen mask on one of them. And then Momen starts to talk to Vader because Momen's mask possesses people. Momen mentions that Mustafar was not always like this, and then he mentions that the Force Locus is actually a door, and he says that the building that he's created for Vader is basically a key. At this point, there's just the blueprints for it. So he says, if you build this building, then it should allow us to open this door to the Locus of the Force, and then you can see Padme again. Vader comments that he's been lied to previously about this, and he's not very happy about being lied to again, and Momen says that he's not lying, and that this will be his masterpiece. And that's where issue 22 ends. So before delving into issue 23, just something that uh, Momin says, which is Mustafar was not always like this. Now, I've mentioned this before in, I can't remember if it's in this run of comics or where, but at some point in Star Wars Comics and Canon, I have mentioned in passing that Mustafar didn't used to be a fire wasteland thing. And one of the fun bits of trivia I like to give people, which I'm almost certainly was thought of after Rise of Skywalker was already made and things. I do not think that J.J. Abrams knew the canon content well enough to establish this. But regardless, um, at the start, of Rise of Skywalker when you see Kylo Ren fighting in that kind of place where there's some like burnt out trees and things there's like sandy floors and he's killing lots of people and then he finds this wayfinder um, in amongst this stone box that's actually the ruins of vader's castle obviously the whole point of this story arc and mustafa looks like that and doesn't look all lava-y and like a terror scape in essence because there is a virtual reality game called vader immortal which i have not played i've just watched people play it and know a lot of the information about it because i can't afford or rather i could afford but i can't really warrant spending upwards of a thousand pounds on vr goggles to play two star wars games because there's another one that's out about the high republican stuff but the general premise is that there's this artifact it's called the bright star and aeons ago there was this person this woman and her husband died and she tried to use this artifact to bring her husband back but the artifact itself is kind of like the heart of mustafa in a way so when she took that and tried to use it for her own selfish purposes it then turned mustafa into this hellscape and it ruined the the lifeblood of the planet this happened, you know, thousands of years before the rise of the Empire or anything like that. So as long in galactic history as we've got in the canon, Mustafar's always looked like this, apart from obviously this game that says otherwise. And in the VR game, and I'll clarify this virtual reality, in that game, basically a descendant of this woman who did all that stuff for the Bright Star gets called to Vader's castle. Vader tries to use the Bright Star to bring back Padme. Surprise, surprise, it doesn't work. And in amidst doing that, the descendant of this woman realizes that the best thing to do is to destroy the Bright Star. So the Bright Star then gets destroyed and then its hold on the planet of Mustafar is ended. And this happens between episode four, A New Hope, and episode six, Return of the Jedi. So it happens at some point vaguely between then, we think. And then once the Bright Star got destroyed, then as I said, the, the planet then starts to heal. So by the time of Rise of Skywalker, which is 30 odd years after the events of this whole Bright Star fiasco happens, then Mustafar begins to heal itself, which is why when Kylo Ren goes there in Rise of Skywalker, you can then see there's trees and stuff. So that's what Momin was talking about when he said the planet wasn't always like this. I presume because Momin has said in passing that he's been about for like millennia in essence he's seen empires rise and fall which i assume is nodding to the great sith wars and the jedi wars which we saw in legends happen but obviously have not been confirmed in canon explicitly as of yet but we know that at least a thousand years before the events of phantom menace was the last time a sith was seen by a jedi and obviously that's about 100 years before yoda was about so thousands of years ago that was the last time sith was seen it's probably even thousands of years before that um that the mustafar thing happened but who knows where Momin was explicitly about? He could have been about five, even 10,000 years ago. Who knows? But when he was about, seemingly Mustafa was either normal or he just kind of knew about it. Who knows? But uh, that's <laughs> the not too brief history of Mustafa, um, which I find incredibly interesting. And the fact it's in a VR game, kudos to them putting it in that game. But you know, I would kind of have loved to be like a story adaptation in the comics or even like an animated thing. I don't know. But then again, I think this whole comic arc of Vader, Fortress Vader thing, I, well, I think this entire comic series, if they were ever going to make a Darth Vader movie, they would make it of this comic. I wouldn't want them to because it takes away from the comic. But equally, I think this comic does such an incredible job of telling all these stories. Um, but anyway, I'm getting sidetracked as per usual. So um, that was the end of issue 22. So we're going on to issue 23. It shows that Momin is trying to build the castle again, and this is now his fifth attempt. We didn't get to see the first four attempts, and 
Vader tries to open the door in that Force Locus. It causes a massive storm over Mustafar and it fails. It shows that the Mustafarians were holding back lava overflowing because they seemingly have some amount of Force sensitivity, it seems. And one of the elders was using a staff of theirs trying to hold back this lava from like overflowing the planet and makes a comment that this keeps happening and they won't be able to hold it back forever. These storms are getting worse each time and it's badness. So they're going to contact the other clans of Mustafar to try and unify them together to stop this all happening. So it shows some lava fleas attack the fortress and some stormtroopers hold them back. Now lava fleas, they're basically elephant-sized fleas that come out of lava. Uh, No, I can't think of many things more terrifying than that. And they look pretty scary when you see them here, but stormtroopers are holding them back, so I guess they're quite easy to kill. And while this is happening, it's also got montage of lots of other designs that Momin tries to make for Vader. And then he finally gets to the ninth design, which is the castle that we know and love. You actually get to see what the finished fortress looks like on the cover of this issue, number 23. But also, any of you guys who've seen Rogue One, and I would assume you all have, and if not, shame on you, um, you get to see it when Krennic goes to Mustafar, and it, you know, he flies to this lava planet, and it doesn't say the words Mustafar, and it's the only planet, I think, in the whole of Rogue One that it doesn't get named when a ship is flying towards it. Obviously, it's on the nose and intentional. And then you get to see the Imperial shuttle that Krennic is in fly to castle vader so you get to see it in there there's also some other comics about it as well but that is where you guys would all probably most recognize it so the ninth design is done so vader goes to open the door to this gate thing and momin suggests him waiting you know to try and recover some of his energy and stuff and vader does not want to wait unsurprisingly as Vader starts to open this portal thing and he can kind of see within it, he gets calmed by the stormtrooper captain saying that the locals are surrounding them. Vader says, just deal with it, I'm busy. And the captain says, uh, we can't really, we need your help, this is quite serious. So Vader huffs and then leaves Momin there, tells Momin to not do anything, and then ventures outside. He sees that the locals and the other clans have all amassed around Fortress Vader and they want to tear the castle down. Meanwhile, it shows that Momin activates the gate and then Vader is struck by lightning, which comes off his fortress thing. And he comments to himself that Momin clearly opened the gate, even though he told him not to. And then the final panels of this comic shows that Momin opens the gate and sees like a shadow of himself come out and he speaks to himself and he basically the possessed body that he's got that's wearing the mask passes the mask to this shadow that's coming out of this gate thing puts on the Momin mask and then he says I am my masterpiece and it shows that Momin has somehow recovered his body back from the netherworld of the force or whatever you want to call it and is now whole again. And so that's where issue 23 ends, so we now go into issue number 24. So the issue starts with the caption, The Battle of Fortress Vader, and it shows that Vader leads the charge with the stormtroopers against the locals. He slices through many lava fleas and other creatures, as well as a lot of the locals there, and he also uses the force to bring lava up and then just burn loads of them. Far off in the distance, there's some Mustafarians, they seem like the elders and things, see Vader, and they've decided that because Vader is clearly the commander, and he's the dark one, as they call him, that they need to use all of their strength unified to call on the blood of Mustafar to burn the world clean. So they do that, and then lava starts to flood from all these cracks in the floor, and basically everywhere gets flooded, aside from the elders that are on this high up rock. That means all the people that were trying to fight Vader at the fortress, as well as all the stormtroopers and everything else, have all basically been flooded flooded with lava. It shows that Vader is underneath the lava and he's managed to make like a force bubble around himself, but his suit is heavily compromised and is failing massively. He manages to pull the wreckage of an AT-AT towards him. He then leaps off the AT-AT, flies into the air, gets out of the lava and then collapses on a rock. He is still on fire, so he uses the force to put himself out, has a couple of moments to breathe, and then heads towards the castle. The remaining Mustafarians, who are the elders and a few other people and some flying bugs and stuff, then attack. As they start to try and tear down the fortress that Vader's in, he uses the Locust Stone to burn them all off. He basically uses the Force with it, and then lightning strikes a bit, and then like these geysers of lava kind of shoot up all around the castle and seemingly yeah, just burn everyone else, all the remaining Mustafarians. Momin then confronts Vader. Momin saw into Vader's mind, and it's confirmed that Vader still believes that he thinks he's the chosen one, that the dark side actually serves him. And Momin says, well, if that were the case, wouldn't your wife still be here? Obviously, Vader isn't very thrilled by this, so they begin to fight. It's quite a cool little battle on things, but Momin eventually cuts off Vader's arm. Obviously, Vader's been quite heavily weakened by having to fight off the Mustafarians, being submerged in lava, and obviously having to do everything else he's been doing over the last few comics. 
So as I said, Momin cuts Vader's arm off, then Momin calls the new Sith pathetic and says that they are Jedi-obsessed weaklings. Vader then uses one of the rocks around this locust thing to slam into Momin against the wall. Momin says that the dark side wants him to be alive, and Vader says, if that is true, then you will. And he crushes Momin again with this giant rock thing, and Momin's body seems to just pancake, basically. There's a bit of blackish blood that splats against Momin's mask, and then the glowing eyes of Momin's mask go out, and he seems to slump. It seems that Momin has then been killed, and Vader mentions that his destiny is his own, and he then activates the portal. And that's where issue number 24 ends. So on to issue number 25, the finale of the 2017 run of Darth Vader comics, and this is arguably my favourite comic ever. Beyond everything I've read from Marvel and from Star Wars and all those sort of things, I just think the imagery in this comic is just absolutely phenomenal. It could be its own animated short, it could be almost its own movie, I just think it's phenomenal. And I highly encourage all of you to check it out at the very least. You know, I've taken like one photo of it, of like the first couple panels that I'll I've put on Patreon and it will be on um, my social media and things as well uh, around the time this episode drops, but I can't encourage you guys enough. Even if you just do like a Marvel Unlimited seven day free trial just to read this comic, it would be worth it. It's just, it's incredible. Um, But I want to add in here something I only noticed as of recording in this session, because I normally record this whole (laughs) podcast, normally in two sessions. And it mentions obviously Charles Saul is the writer, but Instead of it being Giuseppe Caimancoli as just the penciler, it says that Giuseppe Caimancoli did the breakdowns and pencils. It then also says that Danielle Orlandini didn't do the inks for this one, he actually did the finishes, and that Cam Smith was actually doing the inks on this. Now, I'm not exactly sure what breakdowns and finishes and all those sorts of other things mean, but as I could tell by reading this, this was quite a big comic to not only write, but obviously illustrate in things. I mean, it's slightly bigger than most comics. Most Marvel comics are about 22 odd pages, between 19 and 22 pages generally. Um, But this one's about 28. So it's a bit more, it's not quite a 32 page bumper issue, but it's definitely a bit more. And obviously it's the finale. And there's so many different colors and different sort of styles that come into this. It's just beautiful visually. So I want to add that in here and I also want to obviously say reading this will 100% be better than me explaining it to you. There's not a huge amount of story specifically, but it's all about visuals and the visions and things. So giving you guys that little drop here, I'm obviously going to give you some bullet point information and you will get the gist of what's going on, but you will get the full weight of it all if you read this yourself. So with that in mind, uh, it starts with Vader walking through the portal. His suit collapses behind him and the figure that enters into this spirit world is basically Vader's charred corpse. You don't get to see a mouth or a nose, you see his eyes and the rest of his skin is all this dark pink slash black burnt style. Um, You actually saw it throughout the previous issues of this whole Vader run. Whenever Vader does some meditation, you get to see this form of his and his arms and legs are like phantom, like a phantom limb. So it's kind of like his figure, his torso and the stumps and his head are this burnt texture while anything from what's been cut off is this blue kind of light in a way. So he walks through these things, he sees a lot of visions of different things, including one which hints at something that is in Star Wars Legends, the Legends continuity, which I believe is in the Plagueis novel by James Lucino. And it basically hints at that Plagueis and Palpatine were experimenting with a lot of Sith alchemy and trying to create like a perfect Sith. I'm very, very layman's terms this. I know a lot of you guys have probably read the Plagueis book and it's not exactly what I'm saying, but it's just for ease of this example, they basically did a lot of Sith alchemy, tried to create a perfect Sith, failed, and in retaliation to that, the Force created Anakin. And that's how it kind of explains him being born in Legends, you know, Shmi having an immaculate conception, you know, the very much the Jesus chosen one sort of mythos and that sort of line of things. Thinking. And it shows the Palpatine was kind of there using the force, and you see this kind of force swirl on Shmi's sort of abdomen area, insinuating that it could be the case. Now, in current canon, I think it's been confirmed that isn't the case, but it's still kind of hinted in things. Uh, it's not really been confirmed since that Plagueis book, which is Legends, but I want to highlight that because that's a very popular book that came out. But walking past that, it shows that Anakin saw some other things and then it shows him as a boy on Tatooine and he sees a shadow of Vader, which is a nod to that teaser poster that came out with the Phantom Menace when you see Anakin walking and then there's the shadow of Vader behind him on like a Tatooine hut. And then it shows that shadow of Vader like attacks young Anakin and then it shows young Anakin waking up in his bed and his mum kind of comforts him in things. And then it shows Vader as himself, as young Anakin, like the nine-year-old boy, 
walking through all of these things now, but still having the burnt flesh. And then he walks through visions of his life and grows. So you've got this young nine-year-old Anakin burnt fleshy thing. It turns into the Padawan young, young Anakin. Then it turns into him from Attack of the Clones. And then it turns into him from Revenge of the Sith with the same hair and things. But obviously it's still all that weird burnt texture and he's now got one of those phantom limbs and it goes through and it shows you a few bits and pieces there it shows he has a confrontation with the Soka, which happens in the future after this comic and things which i'm not going to delve any more into people who know know people who don't check out the animated series because they're all amazing then this version of vader walks into the jedi temple now he walks up to this Jedi temple and there's this really cool double page spread where you see loads of Jedi confront this version of Vader. Now I'm going to read them all to you. Um, there's quite a few, so let's do it. So there's Ferran Bar, there's Yaddle, which is the only other member of Yoda's species in canon aside from Grogu, who she has no speaking lines, it's a female, and you get to see her in The Phantom Menace, it's basically Yoda with hair. In the High Republic, out of the Shadows book, she actually has some speaking lines as well, but I'm not going to get into that here. Uh, there's also Yariel Poof, who is a Quermian, and he was alive in the High Republic era as well. There's Jocasta Nu, who I tackled earlier in this comic run. There's Shark T, who is a Togruta. Um, she's infamous because in Revenge of the Sith, I think she has two death scenes that were deleted. She also had a death scene in the Force Unleashed game, which is my favorite Legends game ever. Uh, and then I think it's then been confirmed in a vision that Yoda had in the Clone Wars Series 6 that she was in fact killed by Anakin in the Jedi Temple, but her death was off screen. Uh, there's also Plo Koon, who is the gentleman with the mouth breathery thing. Uh, he is in the Clone Wars a bit, but you see him get killed in the Order 66 montage. He's in a starfighter and gets shot from behind. There is Quinlan Voss, who is someone who is a main character in the Dark Disciple book. He's also in a couple of arcs with the Clone Wars, but he has not been confirmed as being killed as of yet. I think they're saving him to be some sort of big reveal, whether it's going to be in The Mandalorian or if it's going to be in some other show, I don't know, but he has not yet been confirmed as dead. There is Mace Windu, who is self-explanatory. There is Depa Belaba, who is in, you get to see her in the Kanan comics, her death. She's also in the Bad Batch. You get to see her death. Um, she is Kanan Jarrus's master, um, who is a character in Star Wars Rebels. Uh, you then also see Saya C. Teen. Saya C. Teen is one of the people who confronted Palpatine with Mace Windu, who gets killed pretty immediately. There is Eeth Koth, who obviously was killed earlier on in this arc. There is Yoda there as well. There is Kirak Infila, who was also earlier on in this comic. And then there is also Adi Gallia. Adi Gallia is a Thalothian. Uh, she is in the Clone Wars and you see her get killed by Maul and Savajo Press in one of the coolest arcs in all of the Clone Wars. So that's all of the Jedi that you get to see here. I only wanted to list them off because I thought it was cool and I actually can name them all, which just goes to show how much my Star Wars knowledge is because um, there are quite a few of those. Um, but yeah, that's a bit of fun. And then you get to see this shadowy burnt version of Anakin then pull out two lightsabers and then proceeds to kill all of them. It's a very cool few panels, but that's all you really need to know plot-wise. If you want to see all that happen, read it. As I said, it's an amazing comic. And that shows Anakin go up to this stairway and it says i am your father and it shows palpatine on the left and obi-wan on the right then palpatine and obi-wan fight palpatine uses force lightning on obi-wan and kills him and then anakin walks up to palpatine who puts his hand out to anakin to stop him going any further anakin then uses the force lightning that's all red and kills palpatine and i want to clarify that in canon vader cannot use force lightning or at least we've never seen him use force lightning he did in legends a little bit there's the, the revenge of the sith game that is amazing uh, he uses it in that that, but to my knowledge in canon, Vader can't actually use Force Lightning. Anyway, he burns Palpatine to a nice little crisp, and then he gets out to this balcony, and he sees that Padme is looking out over this balcony. He says her name, and she turns around, and Anakin is no longer this strange, burnt, shadowy, phantom limb figure. He is Anakin as we saw him in Revenge of the Sith. Padme says a couple of things that Anakin says to him, like, you know, are you an angel? They're the most beautiful things in the universe, etc. And then Anakin tries to reach for her and says, look, we need to go. And she says, but I don't know you. Anakin Skywalker is dead. And then she then either falls or jumps off the balcony. She starts to fall and Anakin is yelling to her saying, I won't let you go. He seems to try and reach out with the force to try and grab her. And then this big red lightning strike from the fortress hits her and just completely obliterates her. She's disintegrated. He screams out. He then says no quite a few times and like a force energy that like repulse comes out from him and starts to crack the things around him. And as he stares out into this wasteland where there's these dead Mustafarians, there's dead Jedi, there's all kinds of just, there's a lot of red, let's put it that way. And he sees this blue beam in the distance appear. A figure climbs out of the blue beam, activates a blue lightsaber, and then this beam blinds Vader and starts to melt him away, and then he wakes up in his suit on the floor. 
outside of this vision. And it doesn't explicitly say, but it's pretty clear to show by the the drawing of this figure in the in the blue light. It was Luke Skywalker, and obviously he was igniting a blade, and obviously that's going to hint to you know Darth Vader in essence being killed by Luke because Luke helps Anakin become redeemed again, which I once again amazing imagery throughout this entirety of this comic. But yeah, so Vader wakes up in his suit and obviously he's had one of his arms sliced off. He uses the Force, picks up his lightsaber and then kind of looks around. He communicates to Palpatine using you know the comms and things and Palpatine asks if it was what Vader needed. Vader then dramatically crushes the comms and then stares out into the distance and says yes. And that, my friends, is where Darth Vader, the 2017 run written by Charles Saul, ends. Oh, I love that comic and reading it any time makes me very, very happy. I want to add in here, I've included a link in the description or show notes, however you're consuming this, um, that I actually did a podcast with Scott Weatherly of the 20th Century Geek. We did uh, Desert Island Comics, so I chose three Star Wars comics that if I got stuck on an island somewhere and could only read these three, what I would choose. One of them I chose was this C-3PO special because that's just a really cool comic that's quite different. And the other two comics I chose was the Darth Vader comic where he bleeds his lightsaber, which is, as I said, one of my favorite comics ever. And then the other one I chose was this one, issue number 25. So if you want to hear my full thoughts and opinions on this comic, as well as Scott's, who I don't know if Scott had read this comic or not before we did the podcast. Um, but if you want to hear two people for like an hour or so discussing the imagery in this comic and some of the meanings, how it connects to the prequels and the original trilogy and all kinds of things, like a break breakdown of all the things that you see in this comic as well as in the other two comics I mentioned. Make sure you check out the Desert Island comics episode of 20th Century Geek that I did. I think it was released in early 2021 from what I can vaguely remember. But as I said, there is a link in the description. But if you look in your podcast player, 20th Century Geek, and you type in Star Wars and Desert, it should come up. Or if you type in my name, then it should come up as well. So um, yeah, that is the end of this Darth Vader run. I hope you guys enjoyed my going through it and breaking down and talking about all the connections. As I said, there are a lot of connections and I'm certain I did not hit all of them. I just want to flag up the ones that either I found interesting or ones I thought were really cool. Um, I just said two things that were very, very similar then. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit tired from <laughs> going through all of that. It melts the brain a little bit uh, going through all this information and then kind of being at the end of it without linear notes to talk about. So uh, with that in mind, what have we got coming up then, my friends? Well, next week, I'm going to be embarking on the first batch of the Bounty Hunters comics. Now, the Bounty Hunters comics central around Bela Valance, who was a character in the Target Vader comics I tackled a while ago. He was also in the Han Solo Imperial Cadet comics that I tackled a while ago. And the Bounty Hunters comics, as you guys are probably aware, are involved in the War of the Bounty Hunters big crossover event that includes the Darth Vader 2020 run, uh, the Star Wars 2020 run, the Doctor Aphra 2020 run, and also the only run of the canon Bounty Hunters comics. So I'm going to be tackling those. I think there's three volumes of those before it connects with the War of the Bounty hunters it might only be two uh, story arcs but i have a feeling there's three i can't remember off the top of my head but that is what i'm going to be tackling next week and then the week after that guys is basically halloween uh, so i'm doing a halloween special and it's still canon and everything but it's the tales from vader's castle there's five anthology stories they're written by Kevin scott and they're basically horror stories for all ages i got these comics bought for me by a friend of mine and i have not yet read any of them so it's gonna be a new experience for all of us this halloween obviously the episode i release will be released on the 30th uh, so you'll get a full day of listening before Halloween actually hits us, um, but you can still enjoy it without it being Halloween. So if you're listening to this and it's already past Halloween, then I'm sure the episode should be out by now. And it's one of three. There's uh, Tales of Vader's Castle, then there's Return to Vader's Castle, and then there's Ghosts of Vader's Castle. I think Ghosts of Vader's Castle is out this year, so 2021, and it seems to be one each year. I haven't fully decided when I'm going to be tackling the Return to Vader's Castle or the Ghosts of Vader's Castle, so I don't know, I'll figure it out <laughs> as and when. Um, but they are by IDW Publishing, so you won't find them on Marvel Unlimited. If you're lucky, you'll find them on Hoopla. Um, I think they might be in Comixology, but I have the physical copy of them so I'm not 100% certain where you'll find them online um, so even more fun and even more reason to listen to this podcast because they're slightly harder to get because to my knowledge IDW doesn't have a unlimited sort of online app like Marvel does um, but I'm getting off topic that's what I'm going to be tackling in two weeks time uh, and then after that I think I'll be then embarking on the fourth full chapter of the War of the Bounty Hunters comics the, the big old crossover event uh, and then after that it will be I think the next batch of the main run of Star Wars comics which will be the second volume and then that will lead into the prelude of the War of the Bounty Hunters 
And then the week after that, I will then be on the 2020 run of Darth Vader comics. So they're written by Greg Pak. I think there's two story arcs before they go into the War of the Bounty Hunters. And the first story arc especially is really, really cool. I do thoroughly enjoy that. The second one is still good. It goes a little bit off the rails, but it's still quite enjoyable. And that's kind of where we're at. Um, at some point, I am planning on doing another book review. Um, I think I'm going to be doing The Rising Storm soon. Uh, I really need to get on that. And then I can do Race to Crash Point Tower. And then I can do Out of the Shadows. And then... You know, before I know it's going to be January and then the next batch of High Republic books are going to be out as well. Um, I am also trying to read the, well, I've got Audible subscription now. So I'm basically trying to listen to more Star Wars books because I haven't actually read all of them. I think Dark Disciple is going to be the next one I listen to, uh, which is the Quinlan Voss Asajj Ventra story that was made out of stuff that was meant to be in the Clone Wars, but obviously Clone Wars got cancelled and then not a lot of the episodes got made when it was Series 7. So that's a whole thing, uh, which I'll be listening to at some point soon. Uh, obviously trying to read several Star Wars books and all these Star Wars comics and listen to Star Wars stuff. It just gets a bit overwhelming at times. So sometimes I need a little break. Um, but that's basically what you can look forward to over the next month or so um the high republic rising storm book review uh, as well as next week bounty hunters the week after that the tales from vader's castle then star wars 2020 volume 2 and then back to oh no then it'll be war of the bounty hunters i'm already getting all messed up guys so i'm just going to stop here thank you so much for listening as always guys make sure you check out my patreon details are in the description for there's one pound a month you get access to the audio feed with loads of hours of extra content early access and those sort of things and you support the show and you get to be a part of fueling me affording to buy all these star wars comics because there are lots of mini series coming out around the high republic there's monster of temple peak there's there's a marquee on road double mini series there's also a life day series that's not to do with the high republic that's coming out as well there's there's recently been one announced, which is Helysion, I think, which is like a tie into the Galactic Star Cruise thing, uh, Disney's Galaxy's Edge, and it's to do with Buriago, the Wookiee Jedi. Uh, and then there's also like a noir miniseries that's come out as well. There's quite a few, and I keep forgetting what their names are, but I will be tackling them at some point soon. Um, so you can have all those things to look forward to. And if you want to help contribute to me reading all these comics and things, then you can access my Patreon at patreon.com slash genuine chit chat. Uh, and also keep an eye on genuine chit chat, my other show, because I'm going to be speaking to a Star Wars artist. Uh, I think next week, I think I'm speaking to them. And so they have been doing artwork for one of the comics that is in the War of the Bounty Hunters big crossover event so that's your little hint and then once i've got that recorded then i'll be telling you guys all about that but aside from that guys you know please uh review comics in motion on any of the usual podcast apps including on good pods or Podmatch or apple podcasts wherever you do that if you're listening on youtube then please like please do a comment as well and please share with all your friends and things anyone who likes star wars can like these comic episodes that i do so please make sure you share that with everyone and obviously check out my show genuine chit chat check out my patreon for other stuff and uh, follow me on social media at genuine chit chat uh, so with all that in mind guys thank you so much for listening as always i appreciate each and every one of you listening especially all the way up to this rambly nonsense end um, i'll talk to you next week with the bounty hunters first volume and as always guys may the force be with you The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit-chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon, found on the Comics in Motion podcast, Mike Burton.